All right, everyone, we will go ahead and get started. First, we want to say thank you to everyone for joining us on what has been a very hopeful week with this first rollout of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine coming to our area tomorrow. I'm Heather Walliga with WBIR. I'm going to serve as your moderator this afternoon. I do want to say, first of all, thank you to Commission Chairman uh, Larson Jay for inviting me to take part in this very important discussion. Uh, while it has been a very hopeful week, it's also been a reminder of this grim reality that we are currently facing with this recent surge of COVID-19 cases. Today, we are reporting the CDC has now ranked Tennessee as the second worst state in the country in the number of people testing positive for COVID-19. As we report yet another day of record high number of single day cases, uh, over 11,000. 52 new deaths as well. And the situation obviously even more dire as we head into the holiday season. Uh, this afternoon, we are talking with some of our local legislative leaders and the region's top medical professionals about the impact the virus is having on our community and how we get through this next phase of the pandemic together. This is not a political debate. This is an in session. that you have all the information that you need to clearly convey what you need to your constituents. Uh, we wanna start this by thanking State Senator, Dr. Richard Briggs, Knox County Commission Chair Larson Jay, Knoxville Vice Mayor Gwen McKenzie and Farragut Vice Mayor Louise Pavlin for putting this virtual roundtable together. We have a lot of people joining us this afternoon. It's good to see a lot of your faces. Uh, we also wanna thank Dr. James Shamia with UT Medical Center. Dr. John Adams with Covenant Health, Dr. Frank Berline with Tenova Healthcare, Dr. Keith Gray with UT Medical Center, Dr. Mark Brown with Covenant Health, Dr. Joe Childs with East Tennessee Children's Hospital, and Dr. Mark Rasnake with UT Medical Center for joining us with your insight. We also wanna thank you for all the incredible work you and your staff are doing each and every day. Your input is very valuable and we're really looking forward to hearing from each of you this afternoon. Uh, we do wanna start with the current COVID-19 situation in our community. As we said, it is not in a good place right now. Um, we wanna turn it over to UT Medical Center's Chief Quality Officer, Dr. James Shimi. I'll let you go ahead and take over. Great, thank you. So I um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk to all of you today. Uh, in addition to being the Chief Quality Officer, I'm also a pulmonary and critical care uh, physician. And so, uh, I, I, I have uh, a few slides to show. I may be the only person today that has actually prepared a few formal slides, but I've gotten used to presenting data throughout this. And I think the best way to really get a sense of where we are in the community is to, to look at data because the, the data really speaks for itself. Uh, I'm going to show you really the uh, current state in the region that this is not uh, just a county problem. Obviously, COVID affects the entire region. And for that matter, the hospitals, um, they don't just serve a county. They, they serve all counties in the region. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, it's really going to be a little bit more of a, present a data presentation focused on hospitals, things like hospital census across the region. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see a COVID-19 data update slide? Okay, great. And so uh, this will just take a, a few minutes. And so first of all, we look at, this is new cases by week and by month. Uh, and to orient you about these slides, um, th there will be Knox County, which uh, speaks for itself, but then that THA Knoxville district is, is how the Tennessee Hospital Association defines the district and it's all the counties in that box. On the left-hand side are new cases by week, and on the right-hand side are new cases by month. And two, to, just to point out two things, one is you see over these last few weeks there on the left, both in the county and the district, the rate of rise of the number of cases that we've had the week after Thanksgiving in the county, 2239, and then the week after that, 2855. But even more importantly, if you look over on the right at the month of December, you see with really with just halfway through the month, uh, we're, we're already at the level we are for all of November. And so the December case diagnoses are going to uh, really, really uh, outpace anything we've seen prior to that. 
So then this looks at the population centers across the state, Shelby, Davidson, Hamilton, and Knox. And uh, notice that the, the left-hand axis is, is, is adjusted depending on the number of cases. But what you see in Knox is uh, just the rate of growth that we've had over these last few weeks. And honestly, our closest peer at this point is, is likely Davidson, uh, just in terms of amount of cases. And that's notable because we certainly don't have the same population that Davidson has. And so that just is an indicator of the, the amount that COVID is spreading within our community. So th this breaks those new cases down by age decades uh, and then 51 and over. And so what you see here, first of all, is that the um, all age, age demographics are now spiking. For, for the last several weeks, it had really just been those 51 and older, but now we're starting to see them all rise. But by far, the new case diagnoses are being driven by those who are 51 and older. I think there's two reasons for this. One is we're at a phase in the pandemic where the thing driving testing by and large are symptoms, and those who are 51 and older are more likely to have symptoms. Um, the other thing though, from a hospital perspective is we know those who are older are more likely to be hospitalized. And so that group that's driving the, the case diagnoses are also a group more likely to be hospitalized. So this is the only slide that is specific to UT Medical Center. And that's just simply because um, this is not the type of information that's available far and wide, but this is a single day at our hospital uh, of the patients hospitalized for COVID-19 and the spread of ages. On the left-hand side are those in, the, in acute care, or in other words, not in the intensive care unit. And on the right-hand side are those that are in the intensive care unit. And what you see is even though uh, clearly there uh, is uh, on, in acute care side, uh, more that are 70 and older, there is quite a distribution of ages represented there. And you see that uh, notably on the intensive care side, there's also a distribution of ages, including those younger ages. So the point is that it's, it's not just something affecting those who are 70 and older. So this is uh, the positivity rate. Uh, and the, uh, you can see that in the, in the early summer, in, in May, well, in spring, summer, May, and June, we were hovering uh, well below 5%. Uh, then in the August timeframe below 10%. And now we seem to be steadily over 20% positivity rate. So when you get this level of, of positivity in terms of positive tests, it, it's just an indicator that, that whatever attempts have been made with quarantining, contact tracing are really, uh, they've, they've stopped, they've ceased to be effective. So now just to wrap up these last few slides to focus on hospitalizations. Uh, these are new hospitalizations, uh, the same orientation by week and by month uh, in the county and the district. And uh, th there's a data lag for a variety of reasons between this, uh, between cases and, and are from a reporting standpoint. So this is not totally up to date, but what you see is we're starting to see that post Thanksgiving spike in new hospitalizations. And you also see on the right hand side, similar to case diagnoses that December is going to likely, with us only being halfway through the month, far exceed uh, November in number of new hospitalizations. And then finally, this is the inpatient census on any given day across all the hospitals, across all of these counties. And so I'll just talk you through this just a, just a minute. This is my, my final slide. Uh, so what you see is, first of all, in the summer, uh, we had a spike to 185 that likely correlated to the combination of Memorial Day and July the 4th. Then, that, then the number came down. And again, this is the number of patients hospitalized each day across the region for COVID-19. So it, it recovered, it came down to some extent, and then it spiked again to 236. Uh, that was uh, likely at least in part related to the Labor Day spike. It leveled off, it didn't come back down and then it's been consistently rising since that time. Um, this, doesn't this rise doesn't correlate with a specific event. We're just now starting to see the post Thanksgiving spike. So what this part likely correlates with is the combination of, the, well, the colder weather that's both impacting the virus to some extent, 
but also leading to people uh, staying indoors and in, in close quarters more. And so uh, when we've projected that out, uh, as, I mean, you can see that line, it's a pretty steady uh, diagonal line upward at this point. We certainly have learned that we cannot predict the future. There's so many variables at play. Uh, as was mentioned, we've had some very good news about the vaccine, uh, but at least from this standpoint, we, we certainly don't anticipate the vaccine having any immediate impact on the, the next 30 days, for example, in terms of the rate of hospitalization. Uh, and then, then we are heading into uh, still experiencing the Thanksgiving spike and then what can be anticipated to come, which is a, a post-December holiday spike. And so with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and hand it back over. All right, Dr. Shamia, thank you very much for sharing that. We want to talk now about the impact of COVID-19 on local hospitals. And for that, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Frank Berline, the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Quality Officer at Tenova Healthcare. Thank you. Uh, first, I'm just going to thank everyone for allowing us to, uh, to be here today and, and present this information. Uh, certainly something we've been dealing with for a long time, and we, uh, we appreciate everyone's desire to know more about it. Uh, we're going to start, I'm actually uh, co-presenting uh, this part with Dr. Keith Gray, uh, the Chief Medical Officer at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, and I'm going to let him start us off with uh, a, a little discussion from there. Thanks, Frank. And again, I want to echo Frank's and James' sentiments for having us here this afternoon to, to share with you. Uh, I am Keith Gray, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Tennessee Medical Center and also a practicing surgical oncologist. So I want, I want to start and talk a little bit about the hospital situation and really uh, start from a 20,000 foot perspective and talk about the, the gains that we have made as a group of hospital systems. The first thing that I'm most proud of is our ability uh, to collaborate. Uh, we formed a collaborative union uh, during this early in this pandemic, really in the, in the early part of March, and committed to addressing these unknowns together. Uh, that collaboration included the University of Tennessee Medical Center, East Tennessee Children's, Covenant Health, to Nova and Blunt Memorial Hospital. We committed to let no system fail, uh, to share information, to be transparent with each other, and to commit most of all to caring for the comprehensive needs of our community. I think our collaborative efforts was a differentiator for us uh, in, the, in the beginning and also now. Uh, from a statewide standpoint, it was clear that we were leaders in the Knoxville metropolitan area in our ability to collaborate and to come up with solutions to address this pandemic. And also our relationship with the Knox County Health Department has been invaluable. Uh, we consider them the hub of the spokes uh, during this collaboration. Uh, secondly, I wanna talk about our priorities. Our priorities again from day one was, was ultimately was patient safety and the safety of our team members. With that said, we limited visitations to keep, to keep both parties safe. We screened our visitors. Uh, we tested our patients that were undergoing surgery uh, to make sure that they were COVID free. We segregate, segregated those with COVID from our non-COVID patients, and we committed to advocating for and practicing the five core measures. We also wanted to maintain a culture of integrity, of trust and transparency for all stakeholders, uh, not the least of which was our patients, providers, and obviously our community. And we wanted again to provide for the comprehensive healthcare needs, not just for COVID patients, but for non-COVID patients. Our constraints now are different from the constraints we had initially. Initially, as you know, our constraints were the unknown, first of all, secondly was testing, and third was our PPE supply. We shut down all non-essentials back in uh, late March and early April, just so we could create uh, an anticipation of the need for capacity and also staffing. staffing. And while that didn't manifest, it, it may not be a stretch to say it didn't manifest because of the aggressive actions that we took. But clearly, we don't want to go back there. We don't want to shut down again. We want to be, continue to take care of the comprehensive needs of our patients. During that time, I think most would agree that we saw some potential exacerbation of disease. And so we want to remain open. Our current constraints, though, are our capacity in light of the data that, that Dr. Shamia just showed you and our ability to staff those beds when we need them. Uh, obviously, all of our team members are vulnerable to the amount of COVID that's in the community, so we wanna keep them healthy so that they can continue to take care of the patients of East Tennessee. We don't wanna delay treatment related to uh, the fear of COVID. 
uh, being in our hospitals, I, I would I would advocate that the hospitals may be one of the safest places to be in in the region as we speak because of all the things that we're doing. And so we want to advocate and let you know to let your constituents know that our hospital is safe and that it remains open for all the needs of our community. We have considered uh, all the hospitals have considered deferring some non essentials that require a bed in order to create that capacity to continue to meet all the needs. But again, we remain open and we remain safe and we're committed not to, if we can all, if we can avoid it, not to return to the shutdown that we saw in March and April. And lastly, just to echo what Dr. Shamia talked about, about the patients, the types of patients that we're seeing, we're seeing COVID patients of all ages, but those that are, have been most adversely impacted have been those greater than age 50, those hospitalized in acute and critical care set, uh, sesh, uh, settings greater than age 60. And as he said, we're breaking records weekly, almost daily in our region, in our 11 county region. We have over 550 patients hospitalized in the region. 20 to 25% of those are in the ICU. 60% of those are on the vent and they have extended lengths of stay, which, which add to our capacity constraints. Um, said in another way, we have a large volume of COVID, which leads to a large volume of hospitalizations for people that stay a long time. And so we need your help and your advocacy to continue to uh, espouse the five core measures to help us uh, flatten the curve and continue to take care of the needs of our community. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Frank. I know he's gonna talk a little bit about COVID therapeutics and, and some other things that we've done as a collaborative healthcare system. Thank you, Dr. Gray. So uh, yeah, as, as uh, was mentioned, we have collaborated among all of our hospital systems. And so we're all kind of in the same boat on, uh, on, on how our ICUs and our, uh, our uh, hospital census is, is trending. Um, our, uh, our RCU, RCUs are stretched to near capacity. Um, we have fluctuations each and every day, each and every hour uh, with where the availabilities are. Um, and we've even, and I think each hospital has increased the number of beds uh, available at the institutions. However, the problem isn't in the number of beds, but the staffing of these beds. Um, you know, our patients have beds at home. The difference is we have to have the care caregivers to provide the medical care necessary to, to save lives. We've employed and trained new caregivers throughout this whole pandemic. Um, we've even gone out and had to get traveling caregivers to come in. Um, there's a shortage of, uh, of uh, trained caregivers late, uh, locally. There's also a shortage of travelers as each and every state has dealt with the same problem. Um, that said, um, if you look at our record numbers, we are still being able to provide the care that's necessary and required uh, for our patients. Uh, the same high quality is present in all of our hospitals, uh, like Dr. Gray said, that we had before COVID. Um, and we will continue to do that uh, as best we can. The, um, the other issue that we want to discuss, and we've mentioned this a few times too, is um, even though we do have COVID, we also know and recognize that we have other elements out there that don't stop. Uh, heart disease is still there, um, diabetes, cancers, et cetera. We still wanna make sure that those people know that they can still come and get care from our hospitals. And we do maintain uh, availability and capability to, to address those issues. Um, our supplies are relatively good. As Dr. Uh, Dr. Gray talked about, that was one of the things that we were able to do with our, uh, our early initiatives uh, as we were able to, to, to build our, our supplies necessary. Um, and, and then also um, one of the uh, one of the locations where we, we've also been trying to build supplies, but struggling a little bit is, is with Medic and our uh, regional blood center. Um, decreased drives availability of, uh, of being able to go out in the community and, and, and draw blood has, uh, has made them struggle a bit. They've been keeping up greatly. I, I can't, I don't know of any, any time at all in the past uh, uh, eight, nine months that we've had to, to delay surgery because of, of blood products, but I would encourage each and every one to, to give blood. If you're a blood giver, continue. If you haven't before, uh, please, uh, please think about giving. Um, because of our ability to work together, uh, we, we work with EMS, um, trying to decide, you know, which hospital can take the patient at a given time. We, um, we transfer among our facilities, uh, directing to whichever facility has the, uh, the availability at the time. 
Uh, rarely we have had to send patients out of our area, yet for the most part, we've accepted patients from outside our region. Again, another, uh, another testament to our, our staff and our hospitals managing this situation. We do realize we're all in this together. Um, our staff, of course, is, is stressed uh, with the challenges from the increased patient load, as well as uh, the fact that, as uh, Dr. Gray mentioned, we have fellow workers who fall ill themselves uh, you know, from, from wherever they get COVID. We don't think they, you know, interestingly, most of them don't get it from the hospital setting. Um, but uh, we, uh, we are pulling together and we are taking care of, of each and every patient, even with our staff uh, having to fight against COVID fatigue. Um, you know, 12-hour shifts and double shifts can, can take a, a toll on personal health, emotions, and home life. But our caregivers um, believe that this is not just a job, it is a calling, and they've stepped up and really are to be applauded in this. Uh, we're proud that our care partners have accepted this additional workload, and through it all, our hospitals have been able to maintain, as I mentioned before, the optimal staffing ratios and the same high quality. Um, since all this started, um, you know, it's fortunate that our, our um, incidence was low at the beginning because now we have a little bit better idea of how to, how to treat these patients, um, the treatments that are available. You know, we have uh, remdesivir, the antiviral that's currently available. We've been using the convalescent plasma from patients who have been previously infected with COVID and now have the antibodies. Um, there are other, uh, other drugs that are coming available. We started a few weeks ago with uh, bamlanivimab, and please don't ask me to say that three times fast. Um, but uh, it's one of the monoclonal antibodies that's directed towards directly towards the, the uh, COVID uh, virus. Um, and then also we've learned to uh, to use anticoagulants um, and because of the uh, increased coagulation that sometimes occurs with severe COVID infections. We have the kinase inhibitor drugs, the 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 nibs that have come out, um, and then of course with uh, with early on, there was discussion about steroids and their place, and we've learned where to use those. And if patients have a, a cytokine storm where they become very ill within the hospital, there's a place for that as well. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things, there are a lot of treatments that we're using that we've, uh, we've gained more knowledge of uh, just even in the past few months and, and availability of, of some of those medications. Uh, and again, as was mentioned by my uh, colleagues, we're all concerned about the, the possible worsening surge from the Christmas holidays if our community does not practice the five cores. And, and I'll speak a little bit more about that later, but uh, Dr. Gray, do you have anything you wanna to finish up with? Again, I tried to start on a positive note and I'll finish on a positive note about lessons learned. I think we've, and I won't get into Dr. Rasnick's expertise, but we've learned a lot about vaccine kind of soup to nuts uh, approval and compressing that we didn't, we didn't compromise safety and, and efficacy, but we did uh, eliminate some of the red tape and the funding barriers that are usually associated with, with vaccine progression. Another uh, win for us as the, in the health systems is, is the establishment of telehealth. Now we were all using telehealth prior to this, but it was probably rudimentary at best. And now telehealth has become a, a part of our armamentarium to take care of our patients. And lastly, we're, we've learned how to get patients out of the hospital that really don't need to be here. They can get adequate care and then transition to home a lot more quickly. COVID has forced us to do that. And I think because of COVID, we will never go back in some of these areas. And so those are some of the wins and gains for us as hospital systems. So thank you. Good to hear. All right, Dr. Gray and Dr. Berline, thank you for that. Um, we talked about the impact of COVID-19 on local hospitals, where we are, and now we want to talk about what we can expect in the future. And for that, we want to turn it over to Dr. Mark Brown, the Chief Medical Officer of Covenant Health. Thank you, Heather, and I'll, I'll echo my colleagues' sentiments. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're, we're happy to be here and speak to this to this group today. Um, you know, since we started this pandemic, I think my definition of what the future is has changed a lot. Uh, a lot of times the future feels like, what are we gonna do tomorrow? Uh, based on the rapid changes that we're seeing and, and the uh, rapid increase in cases that we've seen. But a, a couple of thoughts just about the short-term future that I think we can anticipate, and then a couple of things for the long-term future. Um, first, and I think James alluded to it, you know, when this pandemic first started, there were a lot of models, there still are a lot of models, looking to predict how many cases, how many deaths, how many ICU patients, how many ventilators. What we've learned is that most of those models are good a couple weeks out, probably at most. 
Um, some of the predictions that were four, six, eight months down the road have either been very high or very low. Uh, all of those models have different suppositions. And we have really shortened the time frame that I think any of us are trying to predict where this is going to go in terms of number of cases, et cetera. Uh, we certainly are looking at local data on a daily basis. And the folks on this group, uh, the folks on this call, the physicians, uh, we literally meet five days out of seven uh, to look at our daily data, to look at where we are within the region, where we are within Knox County, where we are in the surrounding regions, uh, so that we can collectively prepare for what tomorrow holds and tomorrow sometimes really is as far as we can see into the future when, it, when we look at the actual number of cases and patients that we have to manage. Uh, I know we've said it a couple of times. I want to put a little bit more meat on the bones. One of the things I think is going to continue into the future is our collaboration as a community. There certainly was a lot of collaboration prior to the pandemic, but just to kind of put some skin on it, all of these gentlemen were my colleagues uh, prior to the pandemic. Now we're all on speed dial. We talk to each other literally every day, if not two, three, four times a day, uh, to be able to help manage this pandemic literally across the community. Uh, we have shared lab supplies. We have shared PPE. Uh, we have worked together to standardize care for all of our patients to make sure that the community standards are the same, no matter whether you get care in Cumberland or whether you get care at UT or whether it's at Morristown or whether it's at Tonoba North. Uh, we want to make sure that you know, we're equitably distributing and equi equitably treating all of our patients in all of our communities. And, and that's really been a, a core of what we've been doing uh, throughout our communication. I think that's gonna be really important in the future. And I think our patients as a community have benefited from that greatly, not just on the COVID side, but as Dr. Gray alluded to, outside of that, I think it's really opened up channels for us to provide an even higher level of care. And I think we already provided a higher level of care to our community, but to continue to elevate the care that we're able to provide for, for all of our patients across all of our communities and counties that we serve. I want to talk a little bit about the vaccine. That's sort of the, the hot topic of the future. I'm not going to get into the uh, mechanics of it, as, as I know John and Mark are going to do here in just a second. But suffice to say, I think we all believe that the vaccine is the beginning of the end and this first vaccine and literally soon is probably as tomorrow, maybe a second vaccine with Moderna coming down uh, the pike. I was checking Google before I got on to see if it had gotten approved before this call. And uh, no EUA yet, but uh, we do believe that the Moderna vaccine is, is soon to follow, and, and Dr. Raznick and Dr. Adams will give details on that here in just a second. But the vaccine itself immediately is not going to change our future overnight. Right? It's, it's going to be a stepwise exit from this. Um, the, you know, when I went back and looked when my first meeting was on COVID-19 on my calendar today. It's 294 days ago on February 26th, uh, and uh, it it really kind of puts in perspective. I mean, 294 days seems like a long time, but man, a lot has happened in 294 days. So we know that it took a while to get to where we are. It's going to take a period of time and no one knows exactly how long, but I think we're all confident that this will certainly be a dimmer switch to get out of this, not a toggle switch. It's going to take us uh, a period of time to sort of step down as we get more people vaccinated, as further treatments come out, as further vaccines come out, all of those things have an impact. And certainly as we continue to practice those five core actions as, as all of my colleagues have alluded to, and I know Dr. Berline is gonna to speak to here in just a second. A couple, a couple of other positive notes that I think are really gonna come out of COVID-19 and Dr. Gray alluded to some of these. Uh, telehealth is here to stay. There's no question. Uh, we, I talked to our chief medical information officer, Dr. Halford frequently, and and she said it well, we really did about three years of acceleration of telehealth in about 90 days. And that literally is no exaggeration. Things that were in the pipe planning to be done were accelerated. Uh, the federal government made some changes, but as much as anything, we had to do it. We didn't have a choice. Uh, and the access that that's provided to patients for all types of services, both on the inpatient and outpatient side has been astonishing. So just as by example, and I can't speak for my other colleagues, what they've got in, in their facilities, but I can speak to Covenant. We've all 
had the access to televisits with our primary care providers or our specialists on our iPhones or our Androids, whatever your preference is, uh, that I think all of us have implemented. Uh, but we have implemented telenephrology. We're doing dialysis at our outlying facilities with nephrologists at our facilities in, in Knoxville doing dialysis at LeCant, at Morristown, uh, at Roan. We're doing telecardiology consults. We're doing telepsychiatry in our emergency departments so that we can decrease the burden on our emergency providers with the behavioral health uh, patients who are still looking for placement across the state. So all of those things have been accelerated greatly. And I don't think those are going away. Those are things that we're going to continue to leverage really very tangibly locally. Telehealth, we hear a lot about it, but in your communities, it's happening today and patients are benefiting from it dramatically. I want to talk a little bit about some other innovations. I know that uh, Dr. Raznick and Dr. Adams are going to talk about the mRNA and how the mRNA vaccines, but the, the mRNA or the messenger RNA technology has been around for a while. And I really think you're going to see that dramatically change the face of medicine. Everybody I've spoken to on, on this call uh, about the mRNA vaccines, especially, it is dramatically going to impact medicine as we know it. It is going to change the way that we practice, not only with immunizations, but also for other therapies. It's been used in cancer and oncology in Dr. Gray's world for a while, but we all believe that that's going to have a dramatic impact on how we practice. Uh, along those lines, uh, and some of these are just my predictions, I do believe that we'll see the faster development of drugs. It takes a long time to get a medication to market, uh, sometimes as long as 17 years to get a, a, a medication to be patented. Uh, and there's a lot of government politics to that. There's a lot of research to that. With the development of the uh, vaccines recently and, and the assistance of the federal government, there has been an incredible redesign in how medications are made. Still very safe, still thoroughly vetted, but doing things in parallel instead of in order, you know, one after another after another so that we can get things to market that much faster. Uh, and I do think you're going to see the faster development of treatments, not just for COVID-19, but, but in general across the board. I think you're going to see different care models that Dr. Gray alluded to. Uh, CMS, Medicare is promoting mo models like hospital at home. I think caring for patients outside of the acute care hospital setting uh, is going to be coming sooner than later. Uh, and that's not necessarily COVID patients, but congestive heart failure, diabetes. Um, arrhythmias, blood clots, there's a lot of things at certain levels that are able to be treated with our home health partners uh, who are invaluable in this equation to be able to care for our patients outside of the acute care hospital setting. There will always be a need for acute care. There are always going to be patients who need to be admitted to a hospital, uh, but we are, I think, going to see a change in those care models. Um, I think we're going to see some IT developments and not to get too far down the IT road, but I think you're going to see a lot more touchless interfaces in healthcare. You know, you, even when you go to pay your, your bills at a restaurant or at a gas station, you're not touching credit card readers, et cetera. There's a lot of touch screens in healthcare. Uh, and I think you're going to see a lot of voice technology. I think you're going to see a lot of investment in that to make things easier to care for patients without having to touch as many things. I think you're going to see those things. So the, the last thing that, that I want to comment on, and I'll go back to my initial comments and, and some of Dr. Shamia's initial comments for when the pandemic, pandemic started. You know, we can't predict the future, but I think we can impact it. And I think we have impacted it by following these five core actions, by doing the things that are difficult for our communities to do, uh, by socially distancing, by wearing masks, by washing our hands, by cleaning surfaces, et cetera. Those things have mattered that has helped us keep the curve flat and keep our health systems able to care for the communities. And I'll add a sixth core action at the risk of stealing Dr. Buchanan's uh, five core actions is when it becomes available, get your vaccine. Uh, I think that that's gonna be very, very important as we move forward in this. And with that, I'll turn it over back to you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sounds like there's some very promising technology in the works in the future. Um, we wanna talk now a little bit about the effect of COVID-19 on children. We've talked about it uh, more in adults, but Dr. Joe Childs, the children's hospital to talk about that today. Heather, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to, to speak with everyone. And uh, I echo the sentiments of 
the other medical leaders that it's been a pleasure to work with over the last uh, the last several months. Uh, I think it's not lost on on most people uh, that uh, this is not as severe a disease for children as it is in the adult population, but they uh, are still affected by it. They still get infections from it. They can they can spread it, and and here at uh, East Tennessee Children's we have. Uh, had about 30 patients that have been admitted with, uh, with, uh, with COVID, uh, a handful of which have been quite ill and needed significant support. And uh, so it is, not, um, it is not true that there are no effects of this uh, on children medically. And then we've learned, as has the rest of the country, that after sometimes mild cases of COVID or, or sometimes asymptomatic cases of COVID, within a few weeks, there can be a very dangerous complication that was first described last spring, in, uh, especially in New York City and in Europe. But uh, this multi-system uh, inflammatory syndrome of children is actually a, a life-threatening complication that uh, occurs three to four weeks later can affect heart and organ function. And these, these patients get quite ill. The, the ages span our entire treatment age range from the first year of life up to late teen years. And um, we have seen this here uh, also a number of cases, especially a cluster around Thanksgiving as local cases in the community uh, have risen. So, uh, children are certainly medically affected by COVID and because they uh, get this infection, they can also uh, spread it in to susceptible adults or vulnerable adults that they may be in contact with depending on their home environment. We've certainly done a, a, a great job, I think, in the community of uh, sharing the learning about how to recognize the serious complications of COVID among pediatric providers. And uh, I think that has had impact on identifying these early. And uh, the good news is it can be treated and uh, reversed uh, usually very quickly uh, if recognized. I, I do wanna comment though, Heather, about um, the impact of, of children that's not related to their medical needs. Um, they are not innocent bystanders in the and the impacts of what changes we've had to make um, to, to deal with the virus. So that impacts them socially, emotionally, um, academically, uh, based on uh, isolation, school changes. And, and I think we're starting to be able to measure and see the toll of this, uh, not, uh, uh, not only here in Knoxville, but across the state. Um, we have seen a, a significant rise in, in visits to pediatric providers and to our emergency room for uh, emotional or mental health concerns. And this, this can include uh, really severe situations, uh, depression, uh, suicide attempts, also can be involving substance abuse uh, and uh, other, other behavioral areas that are very concerning. This is um, this is approaching uh, disastrous proportions in terms of uh, how much of this is uh, being seen in offices and ERs uh, in our community and across the state. So um, I, I, I just want to share that as a, as, a, as a major concern that from a resource standpoint, there's going to be significant future needs of dealing with the impact of this. And I think we're also just learning about the educational impact uh, and delays in learning and delays in development that are coupled with uh, especially the most vulnerable of children, those who may have special learning needs or developmental disabilities, also may be disadvantaged by their uh, socioeconomic status, uh, we know that, especially in the Hispanic community, uh, there are measurable losses of, um, of especially economic resources for those families and the impact for um, 
availability of food and uh, extra resources that are needed to help during the stressful time are just, are just lacking. So as advocates for children, I think here at East Tennessee Children's, we, we really want to emphasize that there is, there is major impact here. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be something we're going to learn about for a long time going forward. We're excited about the development of the vaccines and certainly uh, immediately impacting our staff to be able to protect us from this illness so we can be here to provide the services that we need to for children. Uh, you may be aware that children have not really been studied yet for, this, for the vaccine and are not receiving the vaccine, but that's important work that lies ahead because to get immunity of, of significant percentage, uh, part of the pediatric population is going to need to be vaccinated to achieve that herd immunity that you hear about. So much to come, but again, we're very excited. Um, we also are very involved in telehealth and other learnings from, from this that are gonna impact us going forward and we're excited about that future. We're very hopeful about the future, especially with days like today where we we know that shipment of vaccine is coming to our city to start the very first stages of community uh, impact of vaccination. It's been an honor to work with the other hospitals and, and leaders. And I think we are in a new era in terms of collaborating and cooperating. And that way we can learn together and make sure that none of us are, are suffering from a lack of availability of certain resources or lack of knowledge about things related to this illness. And we at Children's have definitely benefited from the adult systems and hospitals uh, in the county and, and as well as at Blunt Memorial. So uh, I, I just wanna thank you again. And I also would share that we are, uh, we have reached out and are available uh, to be a resource to our adult partners as uh, the situation um, dictates. If things worsen, Children's Hospital is here to extend our, to stretch our capabilities in terms of caring for uh, not just pediatric patients, but, uh, but young adults. We certainly hope that's not necessary, but you saw Dr. Shamia's slides on the, the uh, current trends and it is extremely troublesome that things may get a bit worse before they get better. So thank you again. And I'm happy later to answer any questions relative to um, our, our hospital and system. Thank you, Dr. Childs. We wanna make time for the question and answer portion of this roundtable, but first we wanna to talk to Dr. Berline again about the value of following the five core actions. Yes, thank you, Heather. So, yeah, we have uh, discussed before about the five cores and, um, of course, how you learn things with repetition. So I, I will go through them again briefly, but uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brown uh, noticed some of them, but, you know, wear a mask, keep your hands away from your face, social distancing, wash and sanit or sanitize your hands, clean surfaces, and, of course, stay home if you're sick. And then, as Dr. Brown mentioned, and if the vaccine is available, take it. Um, you know, when we're looking at all these, there's a, a recent article and it's taken an, an older uh, study or an older uh, analogy rather and saying that all these things are like slices of Swiss cheese. None of these are 100%. But when you take those slices and you stack them up together, the holes get covered and your, um, your likelihood of developing COVID is, uh, is diminished significantly. Um, the mask in and of itself there was a, uh, a recent article by the University of, uh, University of Vanderbilt, excuse me, Vanderbilt University, um, that uh, stated it's very clear that areas where masking requirements have remained in place have seen much lower growth in COVID-19 hospitalizations. So that is good evidence that, uh, that we need to continue wearing a mask um, it, it, everywhere that we're exposed to others. Um, and, and, you know, the nose is connected to the mouth and the rest of the lungs. We need to make sure we wear those masks properly. Uh, the other thing about the mask and, and doing these things is it actually has also helped us with our, our flu for the year. Um, I didn't mention, but I'm a uh, surgical and clinical pathologist. I went and asked our uh, med techs the other day, what are we seeing as far as our flu numbers? And they, uh, they mentioned that they were quite low compared to previous years. 
um, I did a little research, uh, the CDC and the WHO, and, and sure enough, um, mm -hmm. the flu prevalence typically this time of year is about 2.6, and we're only seeing about a 1.6 in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, that's about a 40% decrease in the flu over what we would normally see. This decrease in the flu means we have less people with severe, um, severe illness uh, from the flu coming to our hospitals. So that does enable us to, to kind of shift some of our resources to our handling COVID. So it's a kind of a, a, nice, a, a nice blessing there uh, to allow that. Um, so um, we, we have to accept, we, we do accept that these five core measures um, do prevent COVID and other diseases. The problem is a lot of people don't participate in this because they think it won't happen to me or anyone I love. Um, many people who end up in the hospital have this same thought. And so I didn't know, I, I didn't think this would happen to me that I would end up here uh, with this. Uh, there's an old adage in medicine that, um, you know, that can be applied here is that even though the risk of death may be less than 1%, if it happens to you, it's 100%. So we need to keep that in mind and uh, keep our guard up. Um, you know, many of our hospitals have, have suffered critical shortages of staff beds after this recent Thanksgiving uh, gathering. Um, and we're concerned about uh, the Christmas and New Year's holidays coming up. And I, I cannot stress enough how these five core measures can help us get through this, uh, this next um, exposure and maybe avoid a tsunami. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you know, our hospital workers may have some, some COVID fatigue, having dealt with this now for, for this many months. We're working through it, but the community has to work through it too. The community has to have, has to avoid COVID fatigue. Each of us has to engage in personal responsibility to prevent the spread of COVID, and we must encourage it in others that we see. Uh, that's, that's all I have on the, the five cores. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we want to move on now to vaccines and the next steps. We'll talk to Dr. John Adams with Covenant Health and also Dr. Mark Rasnick with UT Medical Center. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this group and to have a chance to speak to our community leaders and state leaders uh, about uh, where we are, what lies ahead, and to try to do so as succinctly as possible, that not always being a ready matter for me. Uh, as we've said, the vaccine is on its way, and we're expected to be getting our supplies tomorrow. I know within Covenant Health, uh, we're going to begin vaccination programs uh, about 6 a.m. on Friday morning, um, and uh, trying to work uh, in a very organized fashion to get our uh, first line healthcare providers and staff uh, immunized and uh, able to be uh, building up our uh, immunity to uh, the virus so that we can continue to provide care to our patients as the surge continues. Uh, as Dr. Brown said, this is, gonna, this is a beginning, this is gonna be incremental. Uh, this is, we, we've got a big hole that we're in and it's gonna take a while to, to climb out of it. The vaccine will definitely help that. And uh, I cannot stress uh, enough just how important this step is. Um, the vaccine has not been rushed. It appears fast because we have seen such a watershed change in our technological capabilities with vaccine development and deployment with this pandemic. Uh, this has never before been seen in human history. Uh, and it is a result of uh, major changes in our understanding of molecular biology and uh, investment and changed paradigms uh, from governmental and regulatory authorities in facilitating the whole process. Uh, but we have very safe, well-studied, highly effective vaccine on trucks right now and a sister vaccine that hopefully will uh, get its uh, EUA review tomorrow at the FDA, uh, the Moderna vaccine. And uh, we all are fully expecting with the numbers that we've seen so far on that, that it will also be approved. That will help enormously because that gives us another entire supply chain uh, for this very valuable product. 
there's a lot of um, myth and misconception about vaccines in general that's been in our community for a long time. And COVID vaccine is certainly no exception. Uh, and I'm not gonna try to go through them. I'd, I'd keep you here all night trying to go through everything that's coming to my ears uh, with, with various misconceptions and myths. I'll be happy to address specific questions that they're uh, raised in the Q&A portion. But uh, just to our, uh, our community leaders and to members of the community that see this subsequently, don't necessarily read everything and take to heart what's on Facebook. Uh, uh, these, are, these are safe, these are effective, and I can tell you, i am already been informed, I'm number one at 6 a.m. for Covenant Health on Friday morning. And it will be with pleasure and without reservation that I roll up my sleeve. Uh, this is safe and this will help. And um, being now in that age group that's a little bit higher risk, I'm glad to be getting it. And uh, as we begin to be able to roll this out, this is going to help enormously. We've still got to maintain all of these core measures and core practices. We've got to wear our masks. We've got to socially distance, wash our hands, avoid large groups. It's hard. This is getting really, really old for all of us. We're in this same group together. We're all a community. It was said it takes a village. We're all together. I'm so proud of East Tennessee and of our leaders and the leaders in our medical systems for coming together over this. Knoxville has always had, East Tennessee has always had a tradition for coming together for things like this. I've been here long enough, I've seen it many times. This is another shining example of how we can work together. Uh, and as a community from the top all the way down, every citizen, we've got to continue to pay attention to the very well-established means by which we can avoid infection and avoid spread of infection while we're rolling out means to then prevent it by vaccination. So um, I just can't stress that enough. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna take all the time. My colleague, Dr. Rasnick, I know has some things to say and I, I want him to have that opportunity. Thanks, John. And uh, I appreciate kind of that lead in and I beat you to the vaccine. Um, I received ah. confirmation from Pfizer about 30 minutes before this that uh, I received active drug in the trial. And uh, I was a participant back in the summer in this mRNA trial uh, from the Pfizer product. And I had trust in that technology from what I had seen from the preclinical studies from the early hundred or so trial participants that look, this looked like a very promising and safe thing. And I received my first two injections in the late summer, early fall of this year. Had no idea which product I received uh, with you know, certainty until about a half an hour before they unmasked trial participants and I had the active drug for this. And uh, that's just a very encouraging thing. But I, you know, knowing more now, I have even more confidence uh, in offering this vaccine, not just having read the data, seeing the preclinical trials, being a trial participant, reason, reading the phase three studies. I've been through all 92 pages of the FDA submission. And uh, I would happily offer this vaccine to any of the staff that we've been working so hard to protect uh, going back since this pandemic started and any of my family members. Um, you know, I wish, I wish I could get them to the head of the line uh, to get us back to normal as a family group. But our staff at the hospital are the most critical ones right now for this community. And we're gonna start tomorrow afternoon with a small group to pilot the system. And then you know, Friday is gonna be our first full day as well. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, the um, thing to expect from the vaccine is it's going to be a constant effort on our part to reassure our employees and when it gets to that time, the public about all the misinformation that might crop up from time to time, but also the legitimate concerns about side effects that you're going to see. There will be a few allergic reactions as this vaccine rolls out that's inherent with any medication that we use. Every antibiotic that I prescribe, there is a handful of patients that are gonna get allergic reactions to things. We can treat those, people recover. We, you know, we support patients as this happens. Uh, also, there are going to be side effects that make people feel poorly for a day or two after the vaccine. People are going to feel run down. They're going to have fevers after the booster dose. That's an expected part of this trial. So we need to be very open with people as we roll this out. 
and tell them that this is going to be a little more challenging in terms of your short-term side effects than a flu shot, but it's going to be very brief, but it's going to provide you a tremendous amount of protection. 95% efficacy against a respiratory virus is unheard of. That is just tremendous levels of efficacy for a vaccine. And technology like this will get us back to normal, but it won't get us back quickly. Just to kind of round up some of the data, Dr. Shamia showed a slide with the state and it had these little numbers on it with decimal places, the basic reproductive number of the virus. And it's just a shade above one kind of everywhere across the state. That means everybody that gets it infects one more person plus a little bit more uh, and it keeps the epidemic propagating. But that number could be a lot higher. The core measures are working. As frustrated as we are with this epidemic accelerating, it really would be a lot worse if we weren't social distancing, if we weren't doing hand hygiene, if we weren't you know, doing what we're doing. And that alone just isn't enough to contain this thing. We need the vaccine with it. And when we start thinking about herd immunity, as long as we're doing those other measures, that herd immunity threshold to stop the epidemic in the short term goes way down. We may only need 20 to 30% vaccine coverage before we start to see a real difference in how it's transmitting. But that doesn't mean we get back to normal because as soon as we start crowding together again and going out without masks and traveling heavily and all the other things we do, interacting in large mass gatherings, the things that we all want to be back. I, I, I really wanna to go to another concert. I just, I need that feeling. But to get back to that level of social interaction, the herd immunity threshold goes up to make that safe. We need to get to 70, 80% or more to really defeat this virus. And so when the numbers go down after the vaccine starts to kick in, it's going to be important to remind folks that we're not out of the woods just yet. We need to continue to do all those other things. The data people pointed out about the flu, the reason the flu is non-existent is because of the core measures. The flu vaccine is an effective vaccine, but only about 30 to 50% on any given year compared to 95% for the COVID vaccine. But we've taken a partially effective vaccine with pretty good population uptake. I think about 60 to 70% of the population gets the flu vaccine. And we throw on board the core measures and you're just not seeing flu. And so we throw in a highly effective COVID vaccine, we get maybe 30% of the population the same mass, math will kind of work out in the short term and we'll see the COVID rates go way down. But again, that doesn't mean we're out of the woods until we get that vaccine, you know, 70, 80%. And that's gonna be when it's more of a challenge. Right now, people are really wanting to get the vaccine because as you saw in that chart, COVID is as bad as it's ever been. And we're seeing the rates just go through the roof and people are paying attention. It's gonna be more difficult to get people to come in for vaccination when the COVID rates go down. It's the same conversation we have about measles sometimes. People have never known someone with measles. Uh, people have never met someone with measles. I've been an infectious disease doctor since 2004 and I've never seen a case of measles. And that doesn't mean measles isn't a threat, uh, but it's you know hard to talk about the vaccine being important when no one's really ever seen measles. COVID will eventually get to that point where it's not everywhere, it's not the only thing people are talking about on the news, and we'll still need to be encouraging this vaccine to make sure we get rid of it and get rid of it for, get rid of it for good so that we can get back to normal. But again, very optimistic. Tomorrow is going to be an extremely busy day uh, getting this vaccine clinic up and running. Uh, a week ago, basically, we didn't know that we would have a vaccine on a certain date, and we had really no definitive plan on how much we had to give. And now we have to have a vaccine clinic in place to vaccinate thousands of people over a two week period over the holidays. The nimble behaviors that we've all learned through COVID has prepared us for this. We're all sort of used to not being able to predict the short term future. We've learned to work together as a team. We know how to roll this stuff out. And so we have people that are used to dealing with this stuff on short notice and getting us where we can deploy this vaccine effectively to our highest risk staff and uh, really looking forward to getting that process started. So I will stop there. If I could add something, I've seen some questions while you were talking coming about on vaccine effectiveness. This may just help get that out. Um, we don't yet really know how long the vaccine is going to be effective, but the preliminary data seem to indicate that we may have a more robust response to this very carefully engineered vaccine that, that directs the entirety of our uh, immunologic uh, uh, capabilities against one specific target area than responding to the entirety of the virus with uh, a, a wide array. It's sort of like 
taking a battalion of soldiers on a 100 mile front versus the same battalion on a one mile front. Uh, you're going to be much more effective on that smaller, smaller area. And uh, I think the data are, are beginning to indicate that although the natural immunity to this virus may be not too long lived, the uh, vaccine immunity may be vastly superior. Uh, we will learn as we go on, uh, but that by no means, any doubts about that by no means reduce the importance of getting as much penetrance of vaccine as it is available as is possible, because even short term, it's going to help. Thank you, Dr. Adams and Dr. Rasnick for your input. We really appreciate that. Um, we do wanna move on now to the question and answer portion of this discussion. We are getting some questions in our chat, so I'll try to keep an eye on that too. Uh, when we came to each of you to be part of this discussion, we asked you for your questions. So most of these questions were submitted by you. Uh, we do wanna remind you that you are the voice collectively of about one to 2 million people. So you can take this very valuable information to your constituents constituents and all citizens region wide. And I'll invite any of our medical professionals to chime in on these questions. Uh, the first one that we got is, why do you think that there has been such a reluctance on the part of the public to accept the science of mass and social uh, gatherings and uh, avoiding large gatherings? Why do you think that there has been a, a reluctance of people to do that? I'll take, I'll take the first stab at that. I, I think because of the conflicting data we heard around masking when the pandemic first started. One was that masking was ineffective or unnecessary. And then we, we pivoted pretty quickly to say masking was helpful. And I, and I think, the, and I believe the latter is true. And I think you've heard that from our experts online today. Secondly, because uh, Dr. Rasnick talked about, you know, longing for the day that he can get back to that concert or that, that social gathering, um, that, you know, as a, as a society, uh, that is, that is how we thrive. Uh, that is how we avoid mental illness as Dr. Uh, Childs talked about before by gathering and enjoying each other's company. When you can't do that, it becomes inconvenient uh, and, and depressing uh, for lack of a better word. So I think the reluctance was around the inconvenience of it. But I think as the science proves the five.